In this lecture, I'm going to finish our discussion of Slaughterhouse-Five. So far, we've looked at how and why Kurt Vonnegut wrote the book. We've also looked at the possibility that Billy Pilgrim, due to a combination of wartime trauma and a head injury, may be inventing the sections on Tralfamidor as a type of potent fantasy, and that the novel in these places is merely following Billy's thought processes, that is, how he perceives his experience, rather than offering us as readers an objective understanding of his situation. To bring this discussion together in this final short part, I want to take a look at Vonnegut's two major themes. The first has to do with the effects of trauma as caused by modern mechanized warfare, and the second is focused on a reaction to ideological wars. So where do we see the effects of trauma in this book? Remember that Vonnegut, as he's writing this book in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, doesn't have the terms or diagnostic tools that we have today. PTSD is a diagnosis of the future. Vonnegut feels that he's witnessing a new type of disorder in people that have been exposed to long-term warfare, a type of trauma that people in previous wars, such as the Revolution and the Civil War, have not experienced. He's pulling together these incidents anecdotally and trying to make a case that people returning from World War II, and now at the time of the book's publication, Vietnam, have a unique sense of trauma that is more significant than combatants in previous wars. And this trauma is tied to the ability to create a larger mechanized warfare that is continuous in its application. Well, the first place we see this is with Billy Pilgrim. The trauma of Pilgrim, according to Vonnegut, happens as the war is going on. I'm on page 78 and 79 in my book. Your book might have slightly different page numbers, but in this section, Billy Pilgrim is crossing Germany as a prisoner of war in one of the rail cars. Here's how the passage reads, and you can start to hear how the poison of the war, the trauma of the war, even as it's happening, is moving inside him so that he's having night terrors over which he is not fully aware. Where can I sleep? Billy asked. Not with me. Not with me, you son of a bitch, said somebody else. You yell, you kick. I do? You're goddamn right you do. And whimper. I do? Keep the hell away from here, Pilgrim. And now there was an acrimonious madrigal, with parts sung in all quarters of the car. Nearly everybody seemingly had an atrocity story of something Billy Pilgrim had done to him in his sleep. Everybody told Billy Pilgrim to keep the hell away. At this point, the novel is diagnosing those moments at which the poison of warfare is moving into Billy's system. It's going to be a poison that he takes with him even after he leaves the war. Once he's back in the United States in Ilium, images of the war continually overwrite what he's seen directly in front of him. As a pretty good rule of thumb, if you have a traumatic experience that you obsess over for six months or maybe even a year, that might be a normal reaction or a normal cycle of grief. But after a year or even two years, if you have trouble engaging on the present, that is, if troubles from the past continually overwhelm you, that's a pretty good rule of thumb that perhaps you might need outside help to help you move beyond the troubles you've experienced. This is exactly what happens to Billy when he's back home. He sees images around him, but what he's interpreting them as are extensions of the war. Billy drove through a scene of even greater desolation. It looked like Dresden after it was firebombed, like the surface of the moon. The house where Billy had grown up used to be somewhere in what was so empty now. This was urban renewal, a new Ilium government center and pavilion for the arts and a peace lagoon and high-rise apartment buildings were going up here soon. In this, Billy can't focus and interpret what he's actually seen. What he is engaged with is something from the past. And then, a little later in the book, we can see how this stays with Billy, even as he's a mature adult. At his 18th wedding anniversary, he pretty much blanks out. He has no idea what's pushed down inside of him, but the book's going to decode it for us. We first see the scene where Billy becomes despondent. And then later, the book helps us understand what is actually going on inside of Billy, though Billy himself does not understand it. 
Here's the section where he falls apart at his wedding anniversary. Now an optometrist called for attention. He proposed the toast to Billy and Valencia, whose anniversary it was. According to the plan, the barbershop quartet of optometrists, the Febs, sang while people drank, and Billy and Valencia put their arms around each other, just glowed. Everybody's eyes were shining. The song was, that old gang of mine. Gee, that song went, but I'd give the world to see that old gang of mine, and so on. A little later, it said, So long forever, old fellows and gals. So long forever, old sweethearts and pals. God bless them. And so on. Unexpectedly, Billy Pilgrim found himself upset by the song and the occasion. He had never had an old gang, old sweethearts and pals, but he missed one anyway. As the quartet made slow, agonized experiments with chords, chords intentionally sour, sour or still unbearably sour, and then a chord that was suffocatingly sweet, and then some sour ones again? Let me just pause there for a second. In an earlier section, we had talked about how perhaps this novel is simply formalizing Billy's thought processes, how he perceives the world, and these sentences here suggest that type of language. We are deeply inside of Billy's consciousness, exploring how he is experiencing the moment through his senses. Billy had a powerful psychosomatic response to the changing chords. His mouth filled with the taste of lemonade, and his face became grotesque, as though he really were being stretched on the torture engine called the rack. He looked so peculiar that several people commented on it solicitously when the song was done. You look awful. Really, I'm okay. And he was, too. Except that he could find no explanation for why the song had affected him so grotesquely. He had supposed for years that he had no secrets from himself. Here was proof that he had a great big secret somewhere inside, and he could not imagine what it was. And so at this point, one of the questions the book asks you as readers is, what is that big secret that Billy is carrying around? And the big secret, as the novel reveals six pages later, is that Billy has repressed all the memories that he carries after he comes out of the meat locker to see the destruction in Dresden around him. I'm now on page in my book, 178. There was a firestorm out there. Dresden was one big flame. The one flame ate everything organic, everything that would burn. It wasn't safe to come out of the shelter until noon the next day. When the Americans and their guards did come out, the sky was black with smoke. The sun was an angry little pinhead. Dresden was like the moon now, nothing but minerals. The stones were hot. Everybody else in the neighborhood was dead, so it goes. The guards drew together instinctively, rolled their eyes. They experimented with one expression, then another, said nothing, though their mouths were often open. They looked like a silent film of a barber shop quartet. So long forever, they might have been singing old fellows and pals, and so on. Here's what we see in this passage. Billy, at his 18th wedding anniversary, is almost able to make the connection between what is happening, these men arranged in a certain semi-circular formation, and what he saw many, many years ago, when he first came out of the shelter but he's not able to move down into that part of him. He's not able to access those memories anymore. They are lost to him, and that is part of his trauma. America is also under a type of trauma. If you define trauma as undigested experience, that is, events that can't be examined closely that cause problems in the present, In this novel, America has made its participation in some events in World War II top secret. We see this in the first chapter when Kurt Vonnegut himself is unable to get information from the government about the bombing of Dresden. And so this book is putting out a formula in which the undigested problems of the past are causing the same types of problems in the present. That is, America is repeating itself because it's not able to analyze or interrogate its own actions as they related to World War II. In World War II, specifically, Vonnegut saw American planes dropping fire on civilian populations. 
This book's saying that because this happened in the past and it wasn't analyzed, it was hidden, it was pushed down like a repressed memory, it's more likely to happen in the present. This book, however, is published during the era of the Vietnam War. During Vietnam, America had the practice of dropping a type of burning jellied gasoline, fire from the sky, napalm or Agent Orange, which was first used to deforest areas in Asia so that Americans could see the battleground more clearly beneath them. But then it was weaponized and used against people. It's referenced a couple of times in our book, but probably the most obvious reference is through a Kilgore Trout novel called The Gutless Wonder. This made-up book features a robot who has halitosis, essentially bad breath, but he's unable to imagine what's happening to the people on the ground when he's dropping fire on them because he doesn't have the circuitry. Everyone likes him just fine once he gets the issue with his breath cleaned up, and so there's a note of irony there. But this book, in terms of our novel, quote, predicted the widespread use of burning jellied gasoline on human beings. It was dropped on them from airplanes. Robots did the dropping. They had no conscience and no circuits which would allow them to imagine what was happening to the people on the ground. Page 168. And so Vonnegut is saying that because these things happened in the past and they are pushed down, they are repressed, they are more likely to happen again in the present. Another way that trauma is presented in this book is through its arrangement. Readers are under a type of trauma when reading this book. And by that I mean if we define trauma as an event in the past that people are unable to get beyond, the reading experience in this book mimics that type of trauma. Most books have a straightforward chronological progression. They start on a certain date and then they move forward, perhaps with a flashback or two, to a date in the future at which the action ends. In this book, we as readers never get away from the war. We start in 1944, and then maybe we move a little bit further, and we go to Billy Pilgrim's uh, childhood, and we go to his marriage, and then we're back in later 1944, and then we're in 1945, and then we're in Dresden. We're at Billy Pilgrim's wedding anniversary. We're at his uh, daughter's wedding. We're at Billy Pilgrim when he goes to work. But the language in this book is always going to yank us back into the war. We're never going to be able to leave the years of 1944 or 1945. Even though this book goes up through the 1970s when Billy Pilgrim is killed, the last part of this book, with that chain of trauma, it loops itself around us and pulls us back to the years of the war. This book ends in 1940. 45, when the Americans are about to be repatriated back to their own country. We're never able to get away from the war, just as Billy Pilgrim's not able to get away from the war, or Bernard O'Hare, or even Kurt Vonnegut. The last place that I want to take a look as an expression of trauma in the book has to do with Kurt Vonnegut himself. He has been working on this book for nearly 25 years, 24 years to be exact. It's a short volume. It's an attempt to externalize this damage and to make something artistic out of it. It's also a way to create something useful out of terrible things that he's experienced. To work on a book for 24 years is an obsessive act. At the beginning of the novel, the novel tells us that Vonnegut has been working on this at night. Specifically, it says that at night he'd call his friends from the war to talk through the things that they had experienced together. And during these moments, while he's connected to this friend or that, out of his mouth would come the smell of mustard gas and roses. And in those early pages, as he's sitting there with his whiskey and his Pall Mall cigarettes, and he doesn't have the best dietary habits either, I think it's pretty easy to imagine that the smell of mustard gas and roses is related to his dietary concerns at the time. But that's not it at all. That unique phrase, mustard gas and roses, is going to be mentioned twice more in the book, and it's only during its last inclusion does the book decode its meaning for us. I'm on page 214. There were hundreds of corpse mines operating by and by. They didn't smell bad at first. Were museums. But then the bodies rotted and liquefied, and the stink was like roses and mustard gas. So it goes. 
And so here, the novel tells us what has fueled Vonnegut's obsession all these years. Back in 1945, after the city was bombed, Vonnegut went down beneath the crust to see the bodies decaying. And it was that smell, the smell of death, that he identified as mustard gas and roses. And that smell got inside of him, the scent of death, so that once he came home from the war, when he breathed that, when he produced words, when those words attached themselves to an exploration of the war, it was the memory or the scent or the experience of being around death that was now coming out of his body, that was creating this book. That is a type of trauma that in this disturbing way is being wielded as a type of creative force. And now for that second thematic question. The question of what do we do as a species if it's true that as nation states we are often drawn into ideological wars, as Vonnegut assumes, in which the battle is not over human life or real property, but rather over how different countries arrange their economic and political cultures. For Vonnegut, World War II was often a war over human life and real property, but the Vietnam War was a war over ideologies. It was a proxy war between the capitalist and the communist over two economic ways of arranging a nation. Also for Vonnegut, the Crusades were ideological wars. One of the things he told me twice, actually, was that World War II, for him, particularly the concentration camps, created a situation in which he could no longer continue with the type of religious experience he had had in his childhood. In terms of personal meaning, this left a significant hole in his inner life. For Vonnegut then, the Crusades, which are often referenced in this novel, are not presented as religious campaigns, but rather as ideological wars in which Europe is trying to impose its culture on the Middle East and North Africa. And so, assuming Vonnegut is right here, how then do humans arranged into nation states move beyond their genetic predisposition to engage these types of ideological wars? Well, the book, I think, has a joke answer. And then the book has a serious answer as well. Here's the joke answer. It's a type of return to innocence. It's on page 73 and 74 in my version of the book. Billy Pilgrim padded downstairs on his blue and ivory feet. He went into the kitchen where the moonlight called his attention to a half bottle of champagne on the kitchen table. All that was left from the reception in the tent. Somebody had stoppered it again. Drink me, it seemed to say. So Billy uncorked it with his thumbs. It didn't make a pop. The champagne was dead, so it goes. Billy looked at the clock on the gas stove. He had an hour to kill before the saucer came. He went into the living room, swinging the bottle like a dinner bell, turned on the television. He came slightly unstuck in time, saw the late movie backwards, then forwards again. It was a movie about American bombers in the Second World War and the gallant men who flew them. Seen backwards by Billy, the story went like this. American planes full of holes and wounded men and corpses took off backwards from an airfield in England. Over France, a few of the German fighter planes flew up at them backwards, sucked bullets and shell fragments from some of the planes and crewmen. They did the same for the wrecked American bombers on the ground, and those planes flew up backwards to join the formation. The formation flew backward over a German city that was in flames. The bombers opened their bomb bay doors, exerted a miraculous magnetism, which shrunk the fires, gathered them into cylindrical steel containers, and lifted the containers into the bellies of the plane. The containers were stored neatly in racks. The Germans below had miraculous devices of their own, which were long steel tubes. They used them to suck more fragments from the crewmen and planes, but there were still a few wounded Americans, though, and some of the bombers were in bad repair. Over France, though, German fighters came up again, made everything and everybody as good as new. When the bombers got back to their base, the steel cylinders were taken from the racks and shipped back to the United States of America, where factories were operating night and day, dismantling the cylinders, separating the dangerous contents into minerals. Touchingly, it was mainly women who did this work. 
The minerals were then shipped to specialists in remote areas. It was their business to put them in the ground to hide them cleverly, so they would never hurt anybody ever again. The American Flyers turned in their uniforms, became high school kids, and Hitler turned into a baby Billy Pilgrim supposed. That wasn't in the movie. Billy was extrapolating. Everybody turned into a baby, and all humanity without exception conspired biologically to produce two perfect people named Adam and Eve, he supposed. And this is the joke answer. If you could find the big mechanism, the large clock that regulates the forward progression of humanity, and switch it from forward to reverse, perhaps you could take time backward to the advent of people when people first appeared on the planet. And Vonnegut is suggesting that at that point, this disposition, this genetic defect, as maybe Vonnegut would put it, is already inside of them. But if you could take time back to the inception of people and maybe a bit further, instead of Adam and Eve, maybe you could find two different people from whom all humanity would descend. And in those two different people, perhaps, if you pick them carefully, you could arrange it so that they did not have this disposition to be so aggressive or defensive about the culture around which they had grown up. That's the joke answer. Take us back in time, find the start of humanity, and simply rearrange things and then move the clock to forward. Well, what's the real answer? Does Vonnegut think that people are able to avoid all wars? It doesn't seem so. At one point in the book, while Vonnegut's at a movie studio, a director tells him that writing an anti-war book is like writing an anti-glacier book. And this, again, remember, is back in the days long before global warming. The point the book is making is that back in 1969, there's no way to stop all glaciers in the same way there's no way to stop all wars. And Vonnegut doesn't object to this. Instead, Vonnegut seems to be putting a new calculus up on the board. One that seems to say that the best way to move through life is to be kind and to consider how others experience their lives. And perhaps most of all, to realize that when you consider going to war, that the cost is no longer the cost to human life and the cost to property. There is this new cost, like the 1.6 million people who came home from World War II that had a type of extended trauma, a type of trauma that did not yet have a name. Vonnegut saying that the rules for engagement in war should be changing, that the leaders of nations now need to add in this new, larger cost, not just those who die, but also the conditions of those who survive. And with that, our discussion on this book is over. If you have any questions, make sure to drop me a note.